Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back out with everyone after what has been too long. And let me tell you how I know it's been too long, because when Drew just sat down after leading that song, I was like, oh, is it really me already? I I had completely forgotten the order of services, but I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be worshiping with our family here. I've got a question for you. It might be a little bit of a strange one, but I want you to think with me for a second. When you think of the end of the world, when you think of the judgment day, when you think of the second coming, what do you think of? What emotions do you think of? What visuals come to mind? I preached a lesson pretty similar to this at, well, I don't know, one of the places I went to. And, uh, and uh, when I asked that question, someone thought they were whispering from the back, but they weren't whispering very well. They said, fire and brimstone! And that's true, that's part of the answer, but I think sometimes that's where we leave the answer, that we tie up all of the second coming and judgment day, and we tie it all up in a nice little fire and brimstone bow, and then we leave it, and we forget the other side of it. But I was reading the end of Revelation, the end of the entire Bible recently, and what struck me, I guess y'all will never know, Uh, (laughs) what struck me was the way that uh, the book ended. And if you want to turn with me, it's chapter 22, verses 20 and 21. Revelation 22, oh, look at that, verses 20 and 21. And this is how the book ends. It says, The one who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord be with all. And then the Bible ends. And what struck me is that one of the last thoughts that the entire Bible wants to leave us with is an excited anticipation for Jesus' return. The Bible ends with the thought that we all as Christians should be hoping and excited for the return of of Jesus, hoping that he comes back soon. But it's not just the end of Revelation. Paul closes the letter of 1 Corinthians in a very similar way. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Maybe that's on our side of fire and brimstone. Maybe that's more what we're thinking of. But then he says, our Lord come, or your Bible might say Maranatha, which is just an error Aramaic word meaning our Lord come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you and my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. One of the last thoughts that Paul wanted the Corinthians to understand from his letter was a call for Jesus to return soon. To eagerly await the second coming. To anticipate the judgment day. The authors of the Bible were excited about what we would call the end of the world. The authors of the Bible were excited about the judgment day. But there's a lot of Christians today that aren't. There's a lot of Christians that when you talk about the judgment day, they understand the fear. They understand the punishment that's going to come to those on the wrong side. And that's certainly true, and I don't want to minimize that for a second. But I think there's a lot of Christians that don't have that excitement 
to say, our Lord come, and mean it right now. A lot of us get a little bit uncomfortable at the thought, I want everyone here to be able to say, I want Jesus to come right now, and mean it. And if we can't do that, there's something wrong. So, the question is, why is that? And I don't know. I'm not going to go through uh, and try to answer every single bit of that. I'm sure there's a lot of reasons that a lot of people, different people have. But what we are going to do today is look at Luke chapter 1 and 2. Now, in Luke 1 and 2, if you want to turn there, you are not going to find any discussion of the final judgment. You are not going to find anything about uh, the last day. That's not what we're going to look at. But what Luke 1 and 2 gives us is a very vivid picture of the way people anticipated Christ in his first coming. The emotions, the feelings that they had around Jesus coming in the flesh. We're going to look at that. And then we're going to look and see what can we apply to the way they viewed the Christ into the way we anticipate Christ today in his second coming. So if you want to turn with me, it's going to be Luke chapter 1 and 2. That's where we're going to be for the majority of this lesson. And we're going to start reading in Luke chapter 1, verse 39. But before we get there, I want to just give you a really brief catch up on where we're at. You haven't missed much in the gospel of Luke yet, but where we are is we start the book by hearing about an older couple, Zechariah the priest and Elizabeth. Luke says that they are a righteous couple, but they are a couple that has no children. They were barren. And an angel comes to Zechariah while he's on his priestly duties, and he says, you are finally going to have a son. Your prayers have been answered. And not only are you going to have a son, he is going to be a son dedicated to God, filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring the people back to the Lord and to prepare a path for the Lord among his people. And then we barely get any time to breathe from that story and to meditate on what just happened, and we immediately get a second story like it. An angel, again, coming this time to a young virgin named Mary, who is engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. And Mary was said to have found favor with God. And the angel says, Mary too will have a son, and this son will be a great king over Judah. Her son will be called the Son of God. And then Mary is told about her relative Elizabeth's pregnancy. So, so far in Luke, all we have really seen so far is God promising to work beautiful miracles of life, both from the old and from the young virgin. That God has promised that not only will he work these amazing miracles of life, if that's not great enough on his own, but that these two sons will lead his people in a return to him. Something big is coming in Judah. So it's an exciting time. These two miraculous pregnancies that are going to change everything. And that's why I find the next story so interesting. Because the next story starts in Luke chapter 1, verse 39. It's Mary and Elizabeth getting to see each other for the first time since these two announcements. And why I find this so interesting is because if you look for the amount of stories we have between when Christ is officially announced, the Christ is coming and he's coming now, and his birth, you don't have very many stories. You have this and the birth of John, and that's just about it. And so that gives us a very interesting opportunity to be able to look at this story and to see how Mary 
and Elizabeth felt about the coming Christ? What did they think the Christ was there to do? So I've talked long enough. Let's just read. If you want to read with me, I'm going to read uh, chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. Chapter 1, verse 39 through 56. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy." And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name." And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. All right, so that's a lot. So first, we see the inspired reaction of both Elizabeth and the baby John. Through the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth realizes that Mary's child will be the Lord. That Mary's child is the chosen one of God, the one that is going to bring blessings to all people. And the baby John is so excited that he leaps for joy in the womb. It is a scene that focuses on blessing and joy and God fulfilling his word to his people. And I find that incredible, especially coming from Elizabeth. Because just think, Elizabeth, the Bible tells us that she has been praying for a son for a long time. I don't know how long, but it says that she's really old and she's been praying for a son for a long time. That's all we know. Imagine how excited she is about her son. Imagine how much she must want to talk about. You will not believe what the angel told me about the son that I am going to have. And that's nowhere in what Elizabeth talks about. Because even though Elizabeth is experiencing this time of great personal blessing, this time of great personal excitement, when Mary comes in and she realizes the boy that Mary is going to have, all of that is gone. Elizabeth realizes that the child that Mary is going to have and his mission is far greater than any blessing that Elizabeth has known. That's what she chooses to focus on. In her humility, Elizabeth acknowledges the mission and the blessings of Jesus. And then Mary responds to Elizabeth's praise with her own psalm or prayer to God. And, and Mary's psalm is beautiful. I wish we had more time to just sit and talk about it. But Mary spends her time praising God. She praises God for his love for all. She praises God's power to reverse the situation on earth. God's power to lift the humble and to lower the proud. God's power to scatter those with evil in their hearts. But also, God's power 
to gather his people to himself and to fulfill his promises to them. The promises that Mary says go all the way back to Abraham, and they do. And of course, we know they go all the way, even further back, all the way to the beginning. Mary realizes that God, in his mercy and love, is using this child to show his power and to show his holiness by delivering his people. All of these things, all of the power and the judgment, yes, that's there, you can't ignore that, but also the faithfulness and the love and the mercy, that all comes through this child. That all comes through the coming of Jesus. That Jesus coming is how God shows his power and holiness and love and faithfulness. Those are all the feelings that are incorporated into the coming of the Christ. Mary gets it and Elizabeth gets it. It's a time of great blessing, much greater than anything else that they had known. And I think that a lot of us understand those feelings. We have a lot of hymns that talk about the judgment day. We have a lot of hymns that talk about our final reward. You can, I've, probably about a half of our book is dedicated to that. But I think sometimes that's where those kind of things get left. I understand what it's supposed to feel like. Maybe I get a sliver of it when we're all singing together. But how does that affect my day-to-day -day life? Because I know a lot of Christians that would take our hymn books and they would sing about how excited they are for the peace and the blessing that God's going to bring. They're excited for eternal life. But then they live in fear of the judgment day. And so why? Luckily, um, that's not the only picture we have in Luke chapter 1 and 2. If you want to turn to Luke 2, that's where we're going to be next. Because Luke 2 gives us almost a more practical look at how anticipating the Christ would affect a faithful Jew's day-to-day -day life. We get two pictures of two righteous people that were spending their life waiting for Jesus. And we get an honest picture of what it looked like to them. What they were doing in the here and now, and what they were excited for. So, if you want to pick up with me, that's going to be... Um, Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 38. Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 38. I should say before we start, sorry, I forgot to say this. We are, so this is, of course, after the birth of Jesus, after this time where all of the things we just talked about have started to come into fruition. The Christ child is here. It is this exciting event that has changed the entire world, and yet most people don't know that it's happened. These two people that we're about to read about, they have been anticipating the birth of Christ for a long time, and they have no idea that he's here. And so we get to see their sort of live reaction to finding out that all of these things that they have been spending their life looking toward, that they have come to pass, and that they are coming to pass. And so let's pick up in uh, verse 22, Luke chapter 2, verse 22. And when the time came for their purification... According to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to uh, what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. 
Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed... And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, or your translation may say 484 years. And she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. Or Jerusalem, sorry. So this is what it looked like every day for the righteous Jews that were anticipating Jesus. Simeon and Anna are portrayed to be very faithful to God. Simeon is said to be righteous and devout, to have the Holy Spirit on him and with him. And Anna is described as being devoted to worship and fasting and praying all day, every day. Not that I think she was probably literally fasting 24-7, but that her life was about this worship and dedication to God. Both of them seem to eagerly be awaiting the hope that is in Jesus. said, Anna uh, spent her days in the temple for a long, long time. Simeon is actually directly said to be waiting for the Christ. So much so that the Spirit tells him, You're going to get to live long enough to see the Christ child. These people were spending their time in service to God, looking forward to his promises being fulfilled. It seems that they built their lives, everything they did, around the hope of Jesus coming. And notice again the feelings around the coming of the Messiah for them. Because they don't deny that it's a time of judgment. In fact, Simeon directly says, this guy is going to bring the fall of a lot of people in Israel. He is going to be an opposition to a lot of people. He acknowledges that. But even then, the focus seems to still be on the revealing of the hearts of men. That Jesus and his word are going to do two things to you. Either you're going to come into devotion to God, or you're going to fall. That's what the coming of Jesus does. And the deciding factor is how your heart responds to Jesus. Do you choose to follow him? Because if so, it's a time of salvation and excitement. Simeon seems to get it a lot better than even most people do throughout the Gospels, because Simeon gets that it's not just a time of glory for the people of Israel, even though he does say that. He understands that this is a salvation going out to all nations. We'd say Simeon seems a little bit ahead of the curve on this. He understands that in the coming of Jesus, God has worked salvation and life and peace for all people. 
That's what the coming of Jesus meant to them. They, like Mary and Elizabeth, recognize this as a beautiful time, a time of joy and mercy and love. Anna focuses on giving thanks to God and spreading the news of redemption, saying, repent while you still can. And that's why they live a faithful life. It's centered around this hope that they are waiting and eagerly anticipating Jesus to come. And that's why they worship. That's why they pray. That's why they fast. That's why they dedicate themselves to God, because it's centered around this hope for salvation. And we are called to center our lives around that same hope. And I think that is sort of the answer of how to find what Revelation has and 1 Corinthians has, that anticipation for, I want Jesus to come now. So that has to be the basis of everything that we do. That hope, that joy in salvation, that has to be the center of our lives as Christians. And the first thing that I think is the key to doing that, wow, that's a lot of words. Um, the first thing that I want to focus on is the remembering who Jesus is. I've played my hand a little bit early on the PowerPoint here, but I, I just wanted to point out the ways that the coming of the Christ is described. I don't have time to go through all of these verses one by one. We've already read them, but look at the ways that this time of Jesus coming into the world is described. You see mercy and grace you see redemption, a salvation to all peoples. And yes, there is judgment. Yes, there is the power of God. But it's also the power of God to fulfill his promises to his people. The power of God to bring joy and peace. And not just peace, but Simeon says peace even in death. Peace unto death. This idea that the time of the coming of Christ is described as a time where everyone's hearts will be exposed. Everyone. And there are two options from that. When Jesus comes, you can experience the judgment and the fear. But if you choose to follow him, if you choose to humble yourself before him... When Jesus comes, you can experience mercy and grace and salvation and peace and joy, even facing all of the death and destruction that this world brings. The anticipation of the Christ is an anticipation of a joyous, momentous occasion that you can build your life around, that you can find complete peace in death. That's the power of the coming of Christ. And we see Christ do all of these things. That's the great part, is that when we see Jesus come in the flesh, we see him work salvation and redemption. We see him work mercy. We see him work judgment. We see him bring about joy and peace. We've seen all that in his first coming. It's a teaser of what's coming next time when he comes back. We can trust that these are all the same things that are coming in the second coming of Christ because we've already seen Jesus work them and he's promised that he will work them again. So the question is what holds us back from feeling this peace and joy? And I think some of it might be, and I don't have much time to talk about this, but I think some of us might be that we know that when Jesus comes, he's going to split the people in two, right? There's going to be judgment 
and there's going to be peace and life and joy. And I think sometimes I don't have an excited anticipation for the judgment because I know I'm not on the side that gets the joy and peace and love and life. That sometimes I can't say, Lord, come quickly. Lord, please come right now. Because I'm not sure if I'm ready right now. Because the reason that Mary and Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna, they were able to have this excitement was because it said Mary was blameless. Elizabeth was righteous. Simeon was dedicated to God. Anna was spent her life in the temple. These were people that had that hope in them and it centered them. These were people who were living righteous lives dedicated to God. And because of that, they got to have these feelings of hope and joy and peace. You only get that when you humble yourself before God. You only get to have the good parts of this list when you have made that hope a part of you. And so as we close, if you, I want all of us to be able to say, Lord, come right now, please, and mean it. I want you to be able to mean that. But you can only mean it if you've come into a relationship with him. You can only mean it if you have this hope centered in you. If you're living a righteous life, if you've dedicated yourself to the coming of Christ, if you've dedicated yourself to him. So don't forget the hope that is in us. Don't forget that, yes, the last day is going to be a day of judgment and fear for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be that for you. You can live in the hope of the joy and peace of Jesus. I'm going to say a prayer and then we're going to be dismissed to our classes. Father in heaven, our souls unite in praise to you. You have done a great and mighty thing. You have shown your life-giving power. You have shown your perfect love and mercy. You have shown your faithfulness to fulfill your promises to your people. Please help your word cut us to the heart and help it reveal in us hearts of flesh devoted to you. Thank you for the hope that we find in your son. Help us to hold on to that hope and to build our lives around that hope. And help us to be nothing more than humble servants of you. We pray all this in your son, our hope, our Lord's name. May he come quickly. Amen.